Thanks so much, uh, Megan. Uh, and just to say that we have had uh, some questions that came in ahead, and there are uh, two or three questions that have come in uh, before we've said anything here, actually. So uh, uh, there will be an active discussion, uh, I believe. And so it's my uh, pleasure to try to set forth what one could call the the big picture for myeloma. In other words, uh, what is the expectation for uh, a patient with myeloma in 2023? Uh, and uh, to do that, I will touch on uh, the subjects that you'll hear about uh, later from from Anne and from Rafat and uh, Saad. Uh, welcome to Saad. Uh, sorry, you weren't here when I introduced you earlier. So glad you can join us. Um, so I will be uh, just touching on what we can expect uh, with uh, uh, frontline therapy in a big picture way, uh, uh, what uh, uh, we can expect in terms of outcomes, uh, what are the big picture uh, expectations for all of the new therapies, and uh, uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, how to really track and follow how all these various treatments uh, are working as you proceed through the uh, myeloma journey. So what can we say about myeloma uh, in 2023? Well, we could say in, in California, uh, if you're very lucky, you have lots of fantastic sunsets here out over the ocean. Uh, and so uh, when you're doing well, there is a lot uh, to enjoy out here in uh, California. But uh, not only that is, is, is a good outlook, but, but really in the big picture, I think that for patients, uh, certainly newly diagnosed patients, uh, uh, it's pretty clear that a long remission uh, is really an expectation these days rather than what used to be something that was rare. Uh, with the frontline therapies you're going to be hearing about, and then all of the backup therapies, um, that first remission is likely or could well be a very long one, meaning yeah, four, five, six years or longer. Uh, and that even with uh, some uh, aggressive approaches and combinations, it may be that even uh, cure is, is, is on the horizon, which is getting uh, closer and closer to reality. And so the, the other important thing is that we are uh, approaching the treatment for myeloma much earlier than we ever did in the past. Uh, diagnosis tends to occur early, uh, and even uh, uh, screening can lead to diagnosis, which is a part of a, a number of research projects now. And so we start the discussion, uh, what should we be doing uh, even earlier than we used to do in the past? If someone has high-risk smoldering myeloma. And this means smoldering myeloma where we think there's a chance that it could progress within one to two years. This is what's called high-risk smoldering myeloma. And we talk about uh, whether or not uh, we should watch or perhaps uh, intervene early. And so we start with this, uh, what we call an, an algorithm uh, for patients with uh, potential new myeloma or smoldering myeloma. This is where discussions begin these days in 2023. We're looking to see, obviously, if there are what we call the crab features. And these are the traditional features of myeloma, where the calcium, blood calcium could be elevated, where there could be renal or kidney problems, where there might be some anemia because of the buildup of myeloma in the bone marrow, and actual bone damage because the myeloma growing in the bone marrow can damage the surrounding bone. So these are the, the crab features. And uh, certainly in the past, uh, many patients had uh, one or more of these features. However, these days, uh, we will consider starting treatment earlier if the percentage of plasma cells is higher uh, in that 60% range, as you can see in that box uh, on the uh, on the left there, if the free light ratio in the blood, which is the level of light chains in the blood, uh, if that's elevated, or if uh, an MRI or some other type of imaging shows more than one uh, lesion in the, in the bones. And so these are early things 
which can be myeloma-defining events. And as I was saying, even earlier, if someone has iris smoldering myeloma, uh, there could be an idea to intervene uh, and really uh, try to achieve the best uh, outcome. And so it's important to realize that things have changed so much in the last 15 years, and, uh, and it's clear will change uh, even more dramatically, probably, in the next five to 10 years. And so 15 years ago, we still uh, talked about chemotherapy. And actually, one of the questions that came in is, you know, when you start treatment, does it always mean uh, chemo? Well, actually, chemo in the traditional sense, the old sense of, of chemotherapy that made you lose your hair and have all different kinds of side effects, is is mostly a thing of the past for myeloma patients now. Uh, it's still used in other kinds of cancer, like breast cancer, lung cancer, and the like. But for myeloma, we've really uh, moved from what was a relapse therapy 15 years ago using Velcade, uh, ortezomib, and Revlimid, which is lenalidomide. That has moved up into the frontline uh, uh, setting, and uh, that is not... Uh, not a chemotherapy, and uh, this is actually based on the uh, 777 SWOG trial, which Dr. Abenar will talk about in a, in, in a little more detail uh, later. And this was a trial in which the Velcade Revlimid Index was compared with Revlimid Index to see if three drugs were better than true drugs. And so let me just say that we uh, will we'll be trying to touch on uh, what all these different drugs are as we uh, as we go through. Uh, next slide. And so with this particular study, the, the most important finding was that the length of the remission, which is in, in the left graph here, the PFS, this is what's called progression-free survival in terms of the number of months, uh, and that is the length of the remission. And uh, if you look at the red one, you can see uh, the top one there is for patients who are under the age of 65, and the length of that first remission is uh, 48 months. It's four years with that first uh, remission. Um, in fact, this may be one of the longest lasting trials uh, ever in myeloma uh, because uh, patients are still you can see these lines are still continuing off to the right, and patients are still actually on this trial and continuing to be uh, monitored uh, with uh, an overall survival, uh, which is uh, remarkably uh, good, with, you can see, uh, uh, over half of the patients in, in these groups uh, doing well at beyond uh, 72 months. Uh, so uh, remarkably good uh, results. Uh, with what is not uh, chemotherapy. And so th the big picture is that we've moved from chemotherapy to using something like uh, that therapy, and there are a lot of options you're going to be hearing about that VRD, uh, Velcade Relevant Index, could be given with a new medicine called daratumumab you'll hear about. And now what we have is we're looking at new things which are currently in the relapse setting, which is CAR T and bispecific uh, monoclonal antibodies. And what we're going to be hearing is what will be probably the next transformation where those therapies will be moving forward into an earlier and even an upfront uh, setting is the way things are going to change. Uh, and that change will include ideas about whether or not patients should still be having an autologous stem cell transplant. And there have been two trials with that, which uh, Dr. Abenar will talk about, uh, where patients received that VRD with and without transplant. And uh, they also had uh, lenalidomide as a maintenance. And in that uh, setting, uh, the big thing that showed up actually is that transplant does make a difference in terms of the length of the remission. Uh, and uh, what's shown here is that whether or not you stay on maintenance makes a difference. Uh, patients who stayed uh, on the lenalidomide as an ongoing uh, maintenance uh, actually uh, stayed in remission significantly longer. Uh, 
uh, with a median survival over over five years in the uh, Dana Farber study, uh, with a little bit less than that in the French part of the trial. Uh, but the main thing is that um, uh, the patients receiving upfront plant transplant did have longer remission. And Dr. Abenar will talk about. Uh, is that sufficient to say that patients should still be getting the transplant? And that'll be an important part of the uh, discussion. Should patients uh, be also getting uh, daratumumab along with their VRD? Uh, this is a Griffin study where half of the patients did get daratumumab along uh, with their VRD. Daratumumab is a monoclonal antibody against uh, CD38 and uh, is a, a very, very effective treatment. And you're going to be hearing a lot more about that as we go forward. This Griffin study shows that if you take the daratumumab, then you're more likely to have a deep response, which is those dark blue curves on the left versus uh, the green ones on the right, uh, with uh, almost a 20% difference there in the, in the deep uh, responses uh, over time. And so uh, taking daratumumab, four drugs versus three drugs, may be the way to go, and we'll talk more about that. But what is perhaps the most exciting, and Dr. Usmani will talk a lot about all of the different exciting immune therapies, but I think that what caught people's eyes at ASH uh, maybe two, three years ago now was the CAR T-cells, the engineered CAR T-cells, immune uh, therapy, where T cells are taken for, from patients, engineered to attack uh, the myeloma. In this case, the B, C, B cell uh, maturation antigen on the surface of the myeloma, BCMA. And with a staggering 97.9% uh, .9 overall response rate in patients with relapsed refractory myeloma. And so this uh, really drew to attention the fact that CAR T cell therapy and and now many of the other very, very active uh, bispecific and other immune therapies can have a huge impact. And we just are waiting to see uh, who will be the ideal candidates and uh, what will be the impact as we move these earlier, earlier into the disease course. And so during the, the rest of the, of the session today, we're going to be talking about all of the different active drugs that we have for myeloma. And uh, this particular slide, I su suggest, can be a cheat sheet for everyone. <laughs> it's got a listing of all the drugs. Uh, it's got uh, the ones in black, which have been approved by the FDA. And so on this particular slide over on the left, uh, you have the old chemotherapy type drugs, uh, melphalan and cytoxin that we don't use that much anymore, steroids, dexamethasone and prednisone, which we do use, and then um, the adriamycin, which is a drug that many of you probably have never even heard of that we used to use in the past. Uh, imids, uh, we still use frequently, uh, the lenalidomide or revlimid being the main one that we use early on, with pomalidomide being used uh, later. And then what we call the proteasome inhibitors, bortezomib or Valcade is the main one that we use up front, but also uh, you'll hear about carfilzomib, which is a very, very important proteasome inhibitor, and uh, exazomib as well, which is uh, uh, an, an oral uh, formulation which can be helpful uh, in maintenance or other uh, settings. Then uh, I think that one of the main boxes is the one uh, in the middle, the anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies, where we'll have a lot of discussion about daratumumab, which is the main anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody, which is so active, and a very similar drug, uh, exazomib. Uh, and then uh, belantamab in the bottom uh, box in the middle, middle uh, is actually currently being with drawn on the U.S. market, but we still will have some discussion about that. Uh, Selenexar is approved. Uh, obviously, the CAR T cells, uh, two uh, cytosol and idosol are approved. And then uh, teclistamab, a bispecific monoclonal antibody, uh, uh, was approved. And actually, 
uh, we're privileged to have Sadhus Mani with us, who was the uh, the principal investigator uh, uh, that led uh, to the approval of this particular uh, monoclonal antibody. But what you see is about half of the uh, drugs on this slide are in red. Uh, and we'll be moving forward, I think, uh, with many of them getting FDA approval in the coming uh, years. And uh, we just are waiting to see what will be the place for these and how big of an impact that they will have. But this is really exciting uh, knowledge for all patients with myeloma. Uh, and you can divide those basically up into the immune approaches, and we're going to be hearing a lot about that, but also uh, the targeted agents, uh, uh, the Selenexor, the Venetoclax, and you, I think maybe you'll hear a little bit about the uh, cell mods, another uh, group of agents. Uh, but uh, as we start out the discussion uh, today, I want to emphasize how do we track if those various therapies are doing a, a good job for you as a patient. And so we're interested in uh, two types of things. Uh, number one uh, is the myeloma coming under control and how do we assess that? And what are the uh, side effects or negative impacts of the therapy that you're taking? And this will be a big uh, topic for Anne in her discussion uh, coming up uh, next. And uh, these toxicities can be uh, side effects, that we can manage, but they can also be things uh, like the cost of one therapy uh, versus another. Uh, uh, can, can this be managed? Uh, and the logistics of uh, IV uh, treatments, infusions, having to be in the hospital for one therapy versus uh, another. Uh, and so those are very, very important things uh, that will be discussed in, in some detail uh, coming up. But taking these uh, uh, one at a time, uh, keeping track of your myeloma, the key things are to track uh, your blood counts to make sure that they are not dropping down because of the uh, uh, impact of the therapy. That means your white blood cell count, as well as your hemoglobin and your platelet count, and that is done every time that you go in uh, to see the doctor for next treatment. But the key testings are SPEP, and UPEP. This is the serum protein electrophoresis and the urine protein electrophoresis. If your myeloma protein happens to be in the urine, sometimes it is only in the urine, but sometimes it's both in the serum and the urine. But these tests tell us uh, the amount of the myeloma protein in the blood and in the urine, and that's how we can tell uh, if the myeloma is still active and the percentage that it has improved as you go through your treatment cycle. One of the amazing things about these new therapies that we have with uh, Velcade, Revlimid, and Dex, uh, or uh, especially with, for example, Daratuma, Velcade, and De Velcade, Revlimid, and Dex, there is a dramatic response where in the first one, two, three months, these uh, tests will show that your myeloma protein has dropped uh, not just by 50%, which would be enough to call it a partial response, uh, but uh, maybe a very good partial response or even into a complete response. And uh, Dr. Abenar will talk about uh, looking for evidence of minimal residual disease when the treatment has been dramatically effective. We also look at free light levels in the blood, which indicate uh, the, the level of the myeloma. And of course, we do scans, we do MRI, uh, x-rays, uh, whole body CT, uh, PET scanning to see uh, where is the myeloma, uh, what is the extent of the myeloma, and is it responding to treatment? And uh, fortunately, we do need that bone marrow uh, for the initial diagnosis, but we don't uh, routinely need to check the bone marrow unless there's some doubt about the status of the, of the myeloma. We can rely upon the levels of the proteins in the blood and the urine, mostly to guide us in terms of how are you tracking with your myeloma. When you get that initial uh, bone marrow done, uh, we are interested in chromosome testing, which is called uh, fish testing, fluorescent, 
in cytohybridization. And we're looking for uh, particular things. Uh, this T1114 is one in particular where we have a medicine, the Nidoclax, which you'll hear a little bit about, which can work specifically in that situation. We're also interested in high-risk myeloma where there are uh, there is a tendency to having shorter remissions, and that is indicated by some other chromosome changes, particularly chromosome 17 and chromosome number one. As a patient, what you'll hear about from Anne is that you do need to be in close touch with your myeloma team. Uh, I'm sorry, Anne, I should have put uh, nurses as well as doctors on this particular slide here. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but you need to alert your team uh, to what's going on. Uh, are you having any side effects, uh, any problems? So the adjustments can be aware. And uh, I think that uh, having ongoing discussions is uh, very, very important. If things are going well, that's great. But if the things are not going well, you need to be aware and have some ongoing discussions about what would be some future options uh, at what point do you maybe need to get an expert opinion to get, get some new uh, uh, advice? Uh, so be, be proactive about that. Uh, uh, be aware, does your center have possible clinical trials, some new therapies available in a trial that you could have access to, or where would be the closest place that you might need to go? And ju just to be thinking about that uh, and set uh, expectations with your current therapy as well as thinking about what would be uh, happening for the future. And, and the good news is, as I've been uh, saying from the beginning, is that uh, the key thing for myeloma patients to be aware of is that there is a future. Uh, that, uh, that first remission uh, quite likely will be a long one, uh, four or five years, uh, uh, even longer. And that with all of these backup therapies, there's like to be uh, likely to be several uh, future, maybe long remissions as well. And so uh, understand uh, these expectations with your, with your primary uh, doctors and nurses. And so uh, I'll stop there for uh, uh, questions uh, and comments. So thank you for your attention. Okay, um, so... Um, Does your definition of a cure mean very long remission, albeit possible side effects and continuation of drugs, or does it mean finding the cause of the myeloma and eliminating it? Uh, uh, well, we can we can all talk about that one. Um, so um, uh, the the definition of, of a cure is is actually rather tricky. Um, uh, I would say that there's there's two definitions. One is uh, where we don't find any evidence of myeloma, and this is MRD negative. But even if we don't find any evidence of myeloma with a particular test, we don't know necessarily how long uh, that might last. Uh, but there's also another category of patient where there may be a small amount of myeloma remaining uh, but that myeloma is not active, uh, and this is almost like uh, an MGUS. And there was a uh, another question that came in, uh, which was asking, uh, what is uh, this MGUS-like app? And this was a, a new thing published by the Spanish group, where they indicated how we can diagnose patients who are likely to be MGUS-like, uh, so they maybe have a small amount of myeloma left, but they, they can be stable and maybe something that we could describe as a as a functional cure, uh, where uh, they're not having any problems, uh, even though we can find a little bit of myeloma left. Uh, maybe I can ask my colleagues, uh, uh, what did you think about this uh, MGUS-like uh, paper that just came out? And also, there's, there's an app that goes with it. Did you guys see that? Maybe not. Yeah, I mean, um, this is obviously a very uh, interesting and exciting tool. I mean, I think for a long time, I, I think the question with Mugus is that, you know, what is the risk of progression? And obviously, we know that uh, the risk is quite small to progress to multiple myeloma. So 
biologically, there is a clone of plasma cells that they just stay dormant for a long time. And uh, I think the Spanish group tried to say, okay, did we do we have that kind of phenotypes? And I guess uh, based on large number of patients, they came up with uh, a way to calculate the risk. And I think it's very useful um, because uh, it may uh, give some, you know, uh, comfort to the patient that based on this calculator that uh, your risk is not going to be that high. And, then they, you know, I, I think one of the most alarming thing about, you know, when you get diagnosed with Muggis, and I was in the clinic today, and I had several patients that I tried to say, okay, I mean, this is Muggis, this is what we know about yes. it. Usually, it's a benign condition, we cannot say it's a benign monoclonal gammopathy, because there is a small risk of continuing to progress. So we need to keep eye on you. But, uh, you know, I think we can use certain uh, criteria to say, okay, are you going to progress quickly? Are you just going to smolder for a long time? Right, right. right. So I think it's kind of useful that way. Right. So will, will you be able to do that uh, at MSK, uh, Sam? Yes, I think so. And, and you know, I would echo R Rafat's enthusiasm about this model. And, uh, you know, we are entering a very interesting, um, you know, uh, era in, um, you know, in, in cancer medicine, in medicine in general, actually, where we'd be able to, um, you know, utilize AI-based platforms to actually dynamically assess the risk. So I think, you know, that's where we're headed. And this is our first step. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 it's good to have these kind of models available to both physicians and patients and have, uh, you know, um, an, an open, you know, um, you know, two-way conversation about it as well. No, I, I, I agree. I think it's an excellent uh, first step in, in that direction. Right, right, right. Yeah, we have a similar effort that will be moving forward uh, in the smoldering myeloma space where we, we actually will have a newer one there on app. Uh, uh, which are more of a dynamic model, as you say, where uh, it can be changing over time and the risk will change uh, as patients come in for uh, follow-up. Uh, let's see. Uh, when I was initially diagnosed, I diagnosed... Uh, well, uh, Asad, you may wish, wish to comment on this. Uh, uh, aggressive, uh, high-risk... Uh, how is the aggressive high risk determined and what does it mean with regards to relapse or other health issues? Uh, so you, you want to make just a brief comment. You'll talk a little bit about it, maybe related to relapse. You want to comment a little bit about high risk? Uh, certainly. So, um, you know, uh, what high risk active myeloma means is that, you know, patients are at a higher chance of the myeloma coming back sooner than expected. And, and we have certain chromosome abnormalities as well as clinical features that can, you know, um, uh, 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 be prognostic for that. Um, and what we have started to do now from a treatment standpoint is, is develop different strategies for our, you know, identified high-risk patients and, and you know, in, in terms of, you know, the kind of induction treatment we, we may give them or maintenance treatment that we may give them. Um, so, you know, that's that's the key issue. Um, however, you know, I think, you know, even the outcome of our, you know, high-risk patients has improved, um, you know, quite a bit over the past decade with the introduction of novel treatments. And and so, you know, I um, I would welcome comments from, from Dr. Abu Naur as well, um, uh, you know, because, you know, we, we, are, we are really fortunate to now have several clinical trials uh, just focused on high-risk patients and trying to find the best strategy for for them. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, also uh, the uh, two ways to manage that one of them again is uh what's called a functional high risk where this is patients where they have actually relapsed within that first year and then uh you know that there is a a problem with a tendency to early relapse and uh managing those patients uh uh, is is an important uh, uh, strategy, and as you say, uh, Sad, um, we many of the, the of the newer therapies are are actually doing a, a pretty good job uh, for this uh, subgroup of patients. Uh, 